Hello guys, welcome to another episode of Amusing Minds. Today, we will be talking with Ashley of Badash Cosplay. We're going to be talking about people watching. Have you ever just sat back and looked at people and the weird things they do? All the time. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you you guys know that, you know, in the past I've done lots and lots of conventions. Go around everywhere and, I mean, not so much last year, but b before that. We're, we're, we're going to... We're going to go before that. In the before times, I, I uh, <laughs> worked a vendor booth at lots of conventions. And so you get a lot of foot traffic, lots of different people. I, I think people watching is one of my favorite forms of entertainment at a convention. Makes sense. One of the things, I guess one of the things I notice about people uh, is, especially at conventions, one thing that I find really interesting about this in particular is observing how unobservant other people are i'll be standing at my vendor booth and somebody will come up and be looking at things and um or or talking to somebody and they're they're always really engaged with whatever's going on and have no idea that i'm there and so when me or another person at the booth is like hey how's it going a lot of times you get the startled oh there's a person and, and they just had no idea that you were even aware of their presence or that you were even a person at the booth. They just walked up to the booth and didn't see a person. They just saw the stuff and were completely oblivious to anything else going on around them. And I, I see it all the time. People are just totally in their own world and oblivious to anything that's outside of them. So you're saying you enjoy that kind of thing. So does that make you a peeping Tom? I mean, you're you're kind of hidden, you know, you're just like, oh, hey, surprise. No, no, no that's not no. Oh, that's okay. not what that is. No. OK, no. I just no. find it. No. It was it was amusing. <laughs> no, no, it makes sense. It makes sense. Because like for me, uh, my thing was, you know, we always go on vacation. So you're up in the room, you're looking down at the pool. People are doing their own thing. And you kind of like start building a narrative in your mind. You're like, I bet she's with that guy. I don't know. Is that mom? Is that her six kids? Or is she like an aunt who's watching them? I, uh, oh, my goodness. What is that man doing? He's got a towel covering him. But, you know, he's no, there's something going on. It's just seeing that kind of whole gallery of people that you're in. You don't know. You don't know from Adam, but who are they? What's their story? What's going on upstairs? Do you always, Larry, when you when you analyze that, do you always kind of build these narratives for those people? You know, sometimes. I think it's through their actions. That's how you kind of build a narrative. And you're like, oh, okay. Yeah, you do kind of look like a jerk. So are you like a CIA sleeper agent or something, just building profiles on people and, and figuring out what's not just what their story, but what did they do? What have they done? I can neither done? deny nor confirm. What are their secrets? Do they have skeletons? The, the CIA thing might be a little bit highbrow for me. I think, I think usually when I'm people watching, because... Not so much anime conventions, but in conventions of the sort, I've gone to those things before. But just in a general sense, like I draw, I do art for the few people who do know me. And um, I have to watch people a lot just to get like uh, analyze how they move, how they talk and just try to incorporate that into pictures. And I would have to agree with Ben on the fact that most people are pretty kind of tunnel vision. They don't really pay attention to the world around them except for the main focus. And they can be startled or shocked out of it. So I think it's less of a we're creeps and more of a it's more of just like when you're step back and you take yourself out of the system, you actually get a better gauge on what's going on as a whole. You know, I think everybody does this. Everybody people watches because we like watching YouTube videos of random people doing random things. It's almost a form of entertainment because, I mean, the person that was in the like fail videos fail videos are still really popular right the person that fell off the skateboard never knows that you're watching but you still seek out those kind of videos because you still want to see what happens you know it draws you in and, and you want to know you know more about what's going to happen and you want to see you either want to see the fail or you want to see the success and and so i think as people were kind of obsessed with watching other people do you think that maybe it's like 
it's a little bit different though when you're talking about reality versus like on a screen because on a screen a lot of the time it's very pre-recorded it's very uh systematic whereas in person it's actually closer to like the fail videos where when you're watching people in real life it's a lot different than when you're watching people on a screen people on a screen are trying to produce themselves they're trying to put something out with the exception of like funny videos and stuff like that and that's more closely related to real life where in real life just like you said when you're sitting behind your booth you notice that people aren't doing certain things and you're getting you're getting a sense of more really who they are mm -hmm. like and in what they are i don't know that's i asked the question and said a lot it's kind of seeing them through the reality lens when they know they're not being judged they're not being I don't know, yeah. interactive with anybody. You get to see the body language because body language usually doesn't lie. So, you know, there's even TV shows that are very close to people watching. I, I forget the name of the show now. Big but, brother. Um, the, the one where they have moral dilemmas and they set up actors that, that, uh, oh, that yeah. play for one side or the other and they see how people, will react or interact and then and then this host guy comes in and it's like why did you do that why did you you know why did you say those things or or why didn't you you take action i forget the name of the show but it was but it's you know you watch that and you was just, it joe schmo what no well let's figure it out because <laughs> that's yeah i know what you're talking about though uh, although first mind was like to catch a what no <laughs> no no uh, not, not that no one. no no, <laughs> no i, I know I know which one you're talking about, where they test the morale of people. Like, yes, they they'll they'll have uh like a someone native to the Middle East or dressed in that way, and they'll have like some person going off on them, saying they're a terrorist or something like that, and they try to see who intervenes to stop that that essentially that hate crime or that that dispute, and they want to see how people respond when they don't know that there's someone there, and this might not be too much of a bad time to you know just kind of take a break and talk about it and bring in our guest and see see kind of their perspective on the topic and continue that okay guys we're back from our break um it's time to introduce our guests this is ashley uh from bad ash cosplay welcome ashley hi Hi, thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. So before our break, uh, we started the conversation about people watching and looking at different uh, looking at people and seeing like how it's different from just sitting back and watching people and how you interact with them. And it's and totally it, not a creepy thing. Nope. Not a <laughs> totally not a creepy thing. Everybody we does did, this. We did touch on that. So just like to kind of like have you tell us like, do you, do you people watch? Do you enjoy watching people? So I'm definitely a people watcher. Um, I sat here and thought about it, and I realized I probably started people watching somewhere in, like, middle school was when I started really thinking about it. Uh, I was definitely a really kind of quiet, shy person, so I didn't talk a whole lot, so instead I observed a lot. Definitely when I go out in public, like, you know, to a mall or to a con where I find myself at a lot, I'm always people watching. There's always something interesting happening, so I'm always trying to, like, gather new information yeah actually uh so you said gather new information one of the things we kind of talked about was how when we're watching people uh when you sit back and you're looking at them uh you learn things you learn a little bit about that person like we talked about how sometimes people you can see that they're not paying attention or they're like immersed in the world that they're in um and, and just kind of things that they do when they do that. Have you ever, like, what are some things you've noticed in your, like, watching people where you're getting that information? Uh, Larry said in, uh, in the previous talk, it was like a CIA, was it CIA agent? Uh, like, yeah, I, I called Larry ben. a CIA. I, oh, that was Ben. Okay, I called so. him a sleeper CIA agent because, because it wasn't just people watching. It was something a little more than that, wasn't it, Larry? It was basically you watching the people, but you sit there and you start to create a interpersonal narrative for what's going on in their lives like oh that's diane why is she yelling at timothy timothy didn't deserve that he fell down he he wasn't pulling on her sleeve but he fell down i don't so is that is that when do you do that when you're gathering your information or is it different i think it just depends on the situations like 
if you're meeting somebody for the first time, it's kind of like you're gathering as much information as you can. So like you're watching, like, are their eyes looking at you? Are they doing something with their hands? What words do they fumble over when they spoke? You know, um, and then like when you're watching something happen between other people, you're like, okay, what's that person's motive versus that person's motive? I also like to look at like, what did that person see and how are, what's their perspective like? And then like, if somebody's arguing, it's usually, people have different perspectives of the situation and now they're just arguing about who is right. And in the end, neither of them are really right. It's just they observe the same thing differently and they're arguing about the same thing. So so when you do that, you see people um, having like those arguments, like you just said, uh, you know, I sit back and I watch and I see that people have disputes and they don't have a good understanding of the sides. Do you learn from that? Like, have you ever taken an experience from watching two people interact and being able to see that third party perspective and being able to apply it to yourself? So I'm gonna say yes, cause I'm very like proud of myself here in all this, but I can't give you a specific example or anything like that. Um, sure. But I would say I do that a lot at my job. I have to observe a lot of people. I'm a, I'm a teacher in the real world. And so I'm observing students all the time and questioning their behavior all the time. And so a lot of times if you observe something between two students, I then think about like, you can kind of see a lot of same situations occasionally. And so you kind of apply that to the next situation. Um, that's really vague. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, no, that it, you, you, it's, it's, it's a vague thing, but it's actually, it still covers, it covers what you're trying to say. When you're able to observe and see what people are doing, uh, it helps you come to like a resolution. And that's not necessarily one thing. It's, it's a diversity of things. Uh, so I think I think it's interesting, and then I have to ask. You said you're a teacher, with within the context of you being the teacher, do you notice similar behaviors between like students' interactions as well as adults? Absolutely. Um, I work at a high school, and I just I I often say that the interactions between the adults were just adult high schoolers. Like we're still we're still doing the same things high schoolers do. We gossip about each other, and it's the same kind of stuff. Just taller, older people. They're always taller. <laughs> Um, everyone's uh, taller. I'm sure they always call me a freshman, so I'm forever a freshman. <laughs> oh boy! So, uh, just aside, what like, uh, what level do you uh, teach at? I'm just curious on that one. I teach high school math, and um, uh, I also teach a class called AVID, it's like a college prep class. So mostly upperclassmen, sophomore, junior, senior. I have a question for Ash. Um, <laughs> so, so part part of what you were talking about made me think about first impressions. Uh, because you said when you first meet someone, you're trying to take in as much, you know, nonverbal and verbal communication as you can to kind of sum up this person and, and get an impression of, of who they are. So I, I, I know this, this will be an interesting anecdote that may, maybe you'll recall. One of the first times you probably got a first impression of me was when I was judging you. Like Ben said, um, he was judging one of the cosplay contests I was in and um, it was a weird situation for me because this was a contest that I'm super comfortable with. I've competed multiple, multiple years. It's my home con. And so it wasn't like that part of the new experience, but Ben was a brand new face along with the other two judges. I think I knew one of them at that moment and I'd met them once. So like these were brand new people to me. I had no idea what to expect. I can't remember if you had your Bob Ross cosplay at that time. I did. Okay. So that definitely shaped my opinion at first. Um, because at first you were just like a guy, I think you were in a beret and glasses. I remember lots of things, random details that are not important. Um, and you seemed super nice, which was cool because when you go in to like get judged for a cosplay contest, you get super nervous. No matter how many times you've done it, you get super nervous. That was nice. Knowing that you looked like a nice person, you had, I'm going to say, you have like nice eyes, like kind eyes. You don't look like a scary, intimidating human being. At the at the end of that contest, just to spoil it for everybody, I did win an award for that contest and I got to be on stage. And there's this super awesome photo. It's like my favorite photo of all time um, of me in the center. And I'm in like the dorkiest rave outfit I've ever made myself. And then all three judges are around me, like pointing at me because I'm because I won. And like Ben's face is super happy, kind, wonderful. And it just kind of sums up. It kind of sums up what we've got going on. So, um, yeah. Oh. Actually, this is interesting. You're talking about the cosplay and how you you had this opinion of him because of how he looked and and it kind of was more just his his facial features, but he was also dressed up in some of your interactions and you dress up in your cosplays and you do those things. Do you ever find a, a difference in your interactions with people when you're in cosplay or when you're out of cosplay? 
And do you find that that shapes your opinion of others or maybe shapes their opinion of you? Um, yes, to all of the above. Um, so I guess people have told me that I act differently when I'm in cosplay. I've even had moments where I've worn cosplay to work. We have lots of like spirit days and so you get to like dress up and they always they always include like a character day and we're like that's secretly for me to wear a cosplay. Like they just <laughs> You've been waiting all year for that. <laughs> exactly. Um and so they a lot of my they a lot of students and a lot of other teachers have told me like you look a lot more confident, you speak a lot stronger, you carry yourself differently when you're in cosplay. And that's probably true for a lot of people, like as you observe them, especially if you observe them in and out of cosplay. There are some key differences and I think I think that's one of the reasons I love cosplay is because it gives me that confidence and I'm not purposely putting on the confidence. The cosplay just does it for me. So you kind of you touched on like the appearance like and how it affects you mentally. Um, and you even said that others probably do that uh, or most likely do do that. They their confidence level or their their character changes when they dress up. Do you ever take that into consideration when you're communicating with someone new? I might ask the question, do you ever question the person's uh, realness when they're dressed up? Um, I don't think I do in that moment. Like when I meet somebody, if I'm talking to somebody at a con and they're in cosplay, I don't question it then. It's later on, like when you friend them on Facebook and you start seeing their social media and stuff like that. Sometimes people appear very differently in that aspect. Or um, I have a couple of cosplay friends I hang out outside of cosplay. Like we're real life friends too. And uh, <laughs> so as you get to know those people, you kind of begin to shape and realize you're like, oh, they did this one thing. Or they said this one thing, and like that's just them in cosplay. That's just them playing the character, having fun, interacting with that fandom of people that may not necessarily be who they are at their their crux of their humanness. You you thinking about and doing the people watching and observing and taking in information and and then using that to get an impression of a person or to relate to that person, does that make you more conscious of what you're doing? Does that make you feel self-conscious about what the things that you do and the things that you say and how that's perceived? I would say yes to an extent, but probably not as much as it should. Um, I'm already, I'm already, I'm decently a self-reflective person. Um, that just kind of comes with my career and who I am. But I'm kind of happy with who I am right now. So I don't do a lot of like, oh, I need to adjust this or change this. I'm just kind of, I'm kind of okay where I'm at with in life. I think honestly, that's a product of the pandemic. Like I'm cool where I'm at right now. Improvement's not really necessary. We're all struggling here. Life goes on. But um, there are moments where I realize um, that there's things that I say that I probably shouldn't have said, or uh, I talk talk too much or talk not enough or something. Um, one thing I really, I hit on a few years ago with myself with reflecting a lot was uh, when you have a conversation with somebody and appearing really selfish, so really self-centered. That really started to bother me because I started noticing in lots of people. And then I realized that when I had a lot of conversations with people, I just said the word I over and over. I do this. I think this. I like this. I like this. And I realized that I was becoming the selfish person as well. And so um, what I did with that is I just tried really, really hard for like two years to not have many conversations where I used the word I as the beginning of the sentence. Try putting you um, or ask a question, things that take the focus off of me. And maybe there's other factors into that, but it definitely made me more conscious about how much I talk about myself and how selfish I seem. That is that is so awesome that you do that. And it's funny because I went through a very similar experience as far as like trying to be aware of being very self, like, no, oh, it's about me. It's about me. I don't know if you did this, and now I'm curious because you said you did it, and this is something I'm very similar around the same time to the last few years. Tried to do that. Did you try to say the same sentences, but just not include the I and analyze whether it was self filling or not? So, like the difference to give you an example, what do you think about uh, blue shirts as opposed to what do you think about my blue shirts or I have a blue shirt? Did you did you find yourself trying to? reformat the sentences just not to use the um the self words um i can't think of the, the term for it i get what uh, you mean yeah. um and no i think my focus more was trying to put the focus of the conversation on either something else or someone else um especially if i'm talking one-on-one -on -one with somebody i try to put the focus on them and so instead of making the question about you know i like blue shirts i would ask them you know what's your favorite color of shirt instead of 
So just kind of, it wasn't completely changing the format of the sentence, more of just like the focus of who who was sharing that important thing about them. Just so we can touch on it, because in this situation, we're interviewing you, so you can eye me all you want. <laughs> and don't feel it. Because whenever, whenever you uh, get in those conversations where you talk about selfishness and focus on self, you immediately start to analyze that in your own mind in the moment. You're like, crap. Yeah, you're like self-aware of it now, and you're like, oh, no, I can't talk about myself anymore. Don't don't, don't look at me. Don't do it. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So in, in the context of this show, it's intentional. <laughs> I want to know okay, if Larry uh, has a thought on this, because he's been quiet. I, I did, and I've been Why? saving it for a while. I was going to let everyone get their peace out. but So, Ash, you, get, you ever get in one of those instances where you're watching, you know, uh, could be random strangers, friends, whatever, but you're watching people off in the distance kind of have, like, a little bit of a drama. Have you ever found yourself just constantly, like, watching that? Like, you'd be having a conversation with someone, but you... Your eyes kind of track over and you're like, well, what's going on now? It's kind of like a mini soap opera type thing where you're just like, I should get involved, but I shouldn't. But so, let me just watch. So to answer that plainly, yes, 100 <laughs> percent of the time. Um, I'm definitely the kind of person that overthinks and has multiple processes happening at once. And so, like, we're having a conversation, but I'm also thinking about, like, my cosplay stuff that's chilling here. And then my dog just barked at something. <laughs> I have to know what that's going on with me. Uh, just yeah no especially at like conventions especially there's always something happening with a group somewhere and i kind of make it like a like a weekend game honestly like i'm watching them and like i noticed we'll just we'll just use them as an example homestuck homestuck people there's always a group of them somewhere doing something the i have no teenagers. i have nothing for them or against them but they are fun to watch there's always yes. interaction and so like episode one is friday at registration what's going on with these guys and then episode <laughs> two friday evening maybe they're young maybe they're intoxicated i don't know what's going on like it's a it's a series of the weekend for sure oh yes you me break down your your convention weekends into episodes <laughs> yeah why not there's it's lots awesome. of things happening <laughs> no it's it's awesome that's so cool there, there's definitely something about people's drama that just really draws us in um I'm, I'm wondering is is that a product of you know drama as an entertainment genre or is drama as an entertainment genre a product of us being obsessed with what's going on with other people and especially if it's something really juicy and like you know you hear people oh but then she said this and and i just i just hate her and and then you're like "Ooh, tell me more <laughs> who who knows man that's that's like the meta of it all and which one started it which one which one created it first um i will say though that the, for me personally there's a limit there's a limit to how much drama i can handle there's been some tv shows where i'm like there is too much happening in one episode for me to care anymore about any of these characters um and that probably is true for me in real life we replace character with people and it's the same thing you know sometimes people are just too much too much drama I'm out of the story. I don't want it anymore. What What's a TV show that you completely dropped because it just got too dramatic? Oh, man, you're going to ask me that. I'm not going to think of one. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> it was a curiosity. Uh, Arrow <laughs> for me. Oh. 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 I, well, well, while we're letting her think that, I'll tell you, out of all of those, Arrow just was so much. And I'm just like, I don't care anymore. I just, and then and actually Supergirl after like a certain number of seasons I really like Supergirl but then to me they started doing too much and I was just like I can't that was Sons of Anarchy for me I was just like ooh this is cool and then you're like okay they're killing everybody off I'm I'm all set Hell on Wheels almost made me quit but I'm a completionist so I was like I'm getting to the finish line I know that I know that there's an ending and I want to know what the ending is even though this show is so heavy and there's so much going on and oh god more people are dying but I want to know I just need to know Okay so you guys hit all your examples and I came up with a few finally it's uh for me it's always those super long animes like Naruto or Bleach oh. I gave up I gave up on both of them, but I always ask somebody, like, what's the final end? And I'm like, does Naruto finally become a Hokage? Cool, thanks. That's all I wanted to know. Appreciate it. Did Sasuke die? All right, cool. I don't care either. So, like, I just, just, 
I hit the point where like my love for all these characters are gone. And so I just, I just Google, I ask somebody, I'm like, Hey, what happened? All right, cool. Now I know. That's it. <laughs> so that's, you, you answered, you answered, and I have a question, but you kind of answered it. Um, cause, cause in that, in that mindset, some shows are just, they're too much. And like, it's like, I want to know what's happened in the end. So I'm just going to Google it. Uh, you kind of already answered that. Um, Ben's a completionist, so he's going to watch it. Larry, do you? For me, I go back and forth. Like, I'll watch something binge. I'm like, oh, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in. And then you're like, uh, am I really paying attention? Am I really enjoying this now? Okay, you know what? Over here. And you just kind of you go off to your next thing. Because yeah, I'll complete it eventually, but you know. <laughs> and that might bring up a, another interesting difference: is people watching on a screen versus people watching in real life. Ooh, yeah, I do it all the time, every day, every day that ends in Y. It's either you know the famous YouTubers, you know, or somebody's channel about learning how to do something, or oh, the news, you know. You're always watching people. But do you separate kind of like performance people from like, you know, sort of the uh, reality, like actual reality, not reality TV, but but um, but videos that show things that just happen to people or mm -hmm. or, you know, interactions that happen or just funny things. Um, so, yeah, yeah you're thinking wait. of the mediums. Yeah. Like comedy versus this is a skit. Let's well, play. That, so. So I'm going to I want to ask Ashley and because we did talk about this a little bit before. So to give you kind of a set question, um, do you find that you well, there's going to be two questions, but I'll ask you the first one. Then I'll ask you the second one after you elaborate. Do you find watching people online in the virtual space is different from watching people in reality? Absolutely. Because because with people on the screen, like you never see the full picture. You, you're never getting the full the full glimpse. You're never even on like a video screen. You don't see what I'm doing with my hands. I mean, my hands come in here once in a while, but you don't see what's going on with my hands fully and what I'm doing and how my posture is. And like you're missing a lot of nonverbal cues along the way. And then the more you take away from that. So if we took away the video, you just have my voice. You would have no idea um, like what my facial expressions look like along the way. And then if you go to like facebook and instagram and stuff all you get is like the text and then you've lost all that nonverbal, and you can read that text in 400 different tones mm -hmm. right right and that's kind of i think that's a general consensus we even kind of come to is the real world obviously is different from the digital world but even in the digital space uh, do you find yourself and and this is just kind of a curious for you as an individual as well as everyone else to answer but i'd like you to answer first um, do you find yourself drawn to a specific type of digital media where you're consuming people? So like, for instance, the difference between like uh, a funny video where clearly the person that was interacting that video had no idea they were being recorded and then a pre-produced uh, video like something on YouTube that's heavily edited. Like, which one do you prefer? Which one do you consume? And then elaborate on like why? And just for clarification, no, not not consuming people like Hannibal Lecter, right? <laughs> I just, I just, want, I just wanted to make that point that we're not talking about cannibalism, you know. That's the reason the clown tastes funny. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> wow. Okay, uh, I think I have my answer to this one prepared-ish. Uh, so I definitely prefer like the people have prepared their presentation and that's what they've chosen to put out into the world, and you know. Um, versus the kind of candid, unplanned, they didn't know it was happening and recording kind of thing. Because A, I'm empathetic and I always feel really, really bad for those people, especially if it's like something sad or we're laughing at their expense. Like I I try to put myself in that in that in that situation and I I wouldn't nail I couldn't handle it. Like I would not be okay with that. Like I hate surprises. I hate any kind of things. My friends have this like meme they made of me. They caught me take they took me I was taking selfies at a con, first of all. Taking selfies at a con and they took pictures of me taking selfies and they have this face where I'm just like and that's my that's my like image. They call it they call it my smolder. And so there's a bajillion smolder memes of me now that go between my friends and I absolutely hate it. I can't stand it. It stresses me out. It freaks me out. I hate it. But they still huh. do it because that's so, what friends. So so you prefer the organized media 
because of your your feelings towards the sympathy towards the the subject of the improv media yes. that's that's interesting and just as a fun opposition i'm the exact opposite i love the improv media because to me that's more real granted i still Fair. like i like the produce things for certain information but i i prefer i prefer it when people present just like wildly kind of information is just coming off the top of their head and they're just saying what they actually feel in the moment but i can definitely see the sympathy like the sympathy tone which i've never actually thought about like i've never considered that as a reason not to consume <laughs> well <laughs> speechless i, I mean, I mean <laughs> for me i've always i've always loved improv in in especially in the media and such like that because you know it you get to see people at their rawest and most natural and you see those people that you're like oh my god is that guy just on 24 7 is he always so quippy and witty and people are like oh yeah yeah it's like oh i hear him say that but i'm watching it over here and i just can't believe it it's true it's true no 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 but look at it you know Seeing is believing sometimes, but at the same time, you also kind of have to take people at their words. Um, candid entertainment is just as entertaining as uh, things that are edited and prepared and produced. Um, and I, I think I watch different things for different reasons. But the 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 candid stuff, it's it's usually the more extreme situations you know extreme drama or or fail videos or um or things that are really spontaneous and funny and and, and those kind of moments and uh and though that's kind of parallel to people watching in real life it, there, there are things that are missing but but it but digital world only highlights the things that are you know really really entertaining whereas you know just standing at a booth at a con you know i i try to find what's entertaining about you know what would otherwise be a pretty mundane thing if you just set up like a gopro and just let it run for an entire convention would people watch that online probably i i don't i don't think i would but See, I'm but like, standing there for eight hours i'm totally gonna for maybe what you're saying it. ben oh i'm sorry let's go, go uh, maybe you set it up really fast and it would be funny and then oh god <laughs> Well, it, for me, Ben, it's it's that uh, the ability to know the unknown, you know, kind of man's quest for knowledge. You're like, well, I know these people weren't doing anything, f you know, amazing or funny, but what were they doing? I just, I just have to know. I'm I'm very much in that wheelhouse. Like to answer that question, the video of just recording like people. There's a there's actually a YouTuber. He does art videos. Uh, but before he like introduces the video, he usually sets up a camera when he's setting up his table at a con and he records himself setting up the table and then he speeds it up like Ash said where um, where the video is going and it's sped up just a little bit, but you get to see all the interactions kind of going around him as he's setting it up. And when I watch his videos, I enjoy that portion of it. So So now I'm just curious in a self kind of way like, I think I would watch that. You put a light music to it and you just like let it. I think I would watch that. T time lapses. <laughs> time lapses are a whole different like ball game for me. Uh, yeah, I I love watching time lapses of just like city street, busy city street. And you just see flow of people and cars and they're just all going going somewhere and doing things. And and you don't even get barely a glimpse of of them now in 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 the case of like a convention time lapse you do get some indication of things that happen but you get a really good summary all in kind of you know a bite-sized chunk but but I, I i still don't think i would watch it if it was just real time you know i i, I think there are some youtube channels or or like some live stream cameras that are out there where you can just tune into the camera and it's just it's just recording you know whatever's in front of it like like weather cameras you can tune into a weather camera and just sit there and just watch the city and 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 apparently there's people that love doing that oh yeah for me the the ability to just sit down and kind of take the world in is it's something that i feel like you can't do truly do it through a screen and when you talk about environments like conventions or like a city park or something 
I, I find that I find that particularly kind of relaxing or even like putting me in a meditative kind of state. Uh, and and just to draw the question, uh, start with you, Ash. Um, do you find that sometimes you sit back and watch people that it does it calm you down? Does it like relax you? Does it help your mind rest? Um, what what is what's the effects that just sitting back has on you? I think for me, there's two answers to that. Um, there's my teacher answer. If I'm like observing students and it's kind of in my case of my job, I feel really serene when things are going good. And as soon as something, as soon as there's some kind of drama, then there's that stress and there's heightened senses and things like that. Um, when it comes to like human me, normal me, <laughs> con me, whatever that is, I don't know. I think I just feel in the moment at that time. And so then just warps my mood whichever way it is whatever kind of environment is around is what's going to shape how i'm feeling and what i'm doing i can't tell you how many times i've been like in a con hotel room when you're putting on your cosplay and there's a busted seam and then you go to put on your wig and your pigtails falling off and you're just you're so frustrated and you're like i hate this so i'm not doing this, this stupid hobby and then you hit the con floor and someone's like hey i love your cosplay can i take your photo and all of a sudden my mood is lifted everything is better and it didn't matter all the issues before. Um, and so I think the people, and especially the people watching, affects that for sure. And I don't know if we're doing this because we haven't talked about this, but if, if for YouTube viewers or people that are in a section where they can make a comment or something, I would like to hear from the audience just in general about, like, how do you feel about that in a whole? How does it affect you on a mental state? And just kind of elaborate on that. That would be cool to hear from our audience. And then, Ben, I'd like you to kind of – Give us your two cents on it. Does it? How does it affect you? It used to be calming. It used to be something that you know could just be entertaining, um, and that was usually on on the con floor. Yeah, but uh, since last year, um, and and I guess I guess I kind of have two answers as well because um, as most of you know, I'm also a teacher, not a high school teacher but a college instructor and I run basically a wooden metal shop. And ever since having that job for six years, when I'm in that environment, my people watching is basically driven by um, whether or not safety is being adhered to. And so there's a, there's a little bit, there's that tinge of paranoia. There's that little bit of anxiety in there because I'm always trying to be aware of what students are doing because, because there's, uh, a risk of injury. Um, as far as just being like out in public, um, it used to be that I liked people watching and I, I really, I found entertainment just walking, you know, just through the mall to the post office to drop off packages, uh, at, at the post office. I, I would look at people and, and, you know, wonder about them and watch what they're doing. And now anytime that, I go into a, pub, a public space. The only thing that I can think of is, are they wearing a mask? Are they wearing it properly? I need to stay away from them. Don't come near me. I don't know. I don't want you to hold the door for me. You can go ahead. And But how do you say that without being rude? Okay, just 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 like trail back a little bit. Let them go through the door first so that they think that it's too much time for them to hold the door. Then you don't have to be near those people. And, and you know, and like the, it's, it's a constant thought yeah. of, of being surrounded by plague rats. Uh, just constantly yeah. anymore. So, so I think, uh, as as sad as it sounds, the pandemic kind of took away my ability to uh, people watch peacefully because now I'm just concerned about everyone and whether or not they're carrying a a disease. <laughs> Your paranoia is heightened up. Yeah, that's that's a short yeah. way to put it. Yeah. Spider well, sense is tingling all the time. We're just gonna mulligan 2020. Like that, it doesn't count. Like we're gonna take that out of everything because otherwise, oh god. Yeah. Okay. So and then, uh, oh, last, yeah. most definitely not least, Larry. Oh yes, I appreciate that. Thank you. I I don't want to be last. I'm just kidding. I don't want to be least. I think we all don't want to be least. But anyway, um, <laughs> you know. It's kind of one thing to view on the screen as this is something I would never be able to see in person. Uh, maybe it was a live thing or something that just snapped off real quick that you're like, oh, God, I can't believe this snap. But to truly go somewhere and experience it like a park bench, you know, you're just sitting there observing everyone. It's kind of like 
you open all your senses, you know, well, for me, for me, I open all my senses more or less, you know, the temperature, you know, what am I feeling right now? Physically, uh, the smells, the sounds, it's just kind of taking it all in and making a quick little mental Polaroid for yourself and being like, at the one point in my life, this was a moment that I stopped and acknowledged and was like, huh? Yeah, okay. Life's not so bad. Or even if it is bad, you're like, this is when life was really bad. So I'm going to remember this to respectfully decline another day when I go, this day sucks. And I'm like, well, remember this day? You know. That's actually, oh man, that's that's really good. Because now you gave me an idea for a, <laughs> kind of kind of play, like a really good question. Um, mm-hmm. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll pose one to kind of set the stage for you guys. Uh, experience, but I would like to hear again, kind of in order. I think this would be a really good question. Just kind of analyze what is one of those lifetime moments where you're absor- observing the world and it just changed you. This 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 life changing experience or this moment in time where you were just you and you just kind of observed something that you wouldn't be able to see on a screen or that just affected you in a certain way um like what is what is that moment for you or if there's multiples like if you have them and and I, i'll share one of mine just to kind of set a stage and get you guys going and then we'll just go in order again i was in a I i i'm in the national guard and i deployed and when i was overseas uh in syria at one point uh there was a night where we were doing a mission, a fuel mission, and the cloud ceiling, so the clouds were super low in, in the sky. And most of the time, uh, we don't fly when the cloud ceiling's so low because it's dangerous. But like the British Brits will, which is awesome. Um, and we had to do this mission. And they had to fly in and land this huge hel- helicopter for just normal people. I'm just going to keep it simple. They had to hand- land this huge helicopter with this low cloud ceiling. And when they came through the clouds, there was like this moment of like awe for me to watch this huge helicopter break through clouds that felt like they were only 10 feet over my head. They were clearly hundreds of feet, but it felt like so low. And it was just this moment of serenity where they broke through the clouds, they angled themselves, and they just landed. And I was just like... I would never see this real moment or or experience this realness from a screen or anywhere else. And I'll never have this experience again. And it was just like a moment of Zen and in me. So my question to you guys is what's that life changing moment of reality where you are observing something, if you have one um, or a moment that just sticks in your memory that is just kind of there. So I went to Europe on uh, on a trip uh, for a band. Basically, um, it wasn't high. It wasn't our high school band. It was like one of these things where like high school students can pay a bunch of money and form a random group of band students to go play concerts in Europe. And uh, and at the time, I was fortunate enough that I got to go. Um, and the thing that was really uh, like a, a changing moment for me um, was probably the Eiffel Tower, which is kind of sounds cliche because it's a tourist spot. But, um, but it was one of those things where it's like, it's so grandiose in person. And um, I made these new friends and were, you know, running up the steps to the mezzanine level where they have like a cafe and stuff. And then you take the elevator to the top. I'm deathly afraid of heights, deathly afraid of heights, but I wanted to do it because I was there and I never knew if I got, I would get to go back. And when I got to the top, my, my friends were just absolutely fearless and, and, um, and coaxing me, you know, you know, come out here. This is so awesome. And, and they're like my observation of their fearlessness pushed me to take that step out outside because basically it was just a fence it's not like in case like there you can stay inside or you can go outside and the outside part there's just a fence between you and the ground and when i finally got like outside i was clinging to the rail but um it was my friends that 
that gave me some courage, but then it was this really random thing. And, and I have to preface this, that I wasn't being a creep because it just happened in front of me. It wasn't something that I expected, nor, nor did I like, you know, I'm like 17 at the time and just out of nowhere, this, this lady who's probably late teens, early twenties lifts up her shirt and just flashes anybody and just says hello paris she was probably drunk who knows um but it was so shocking to witness that happen that that i forgot that i was that high up and and of course she left really quickly and and i found myself going up to the edge of the rail and actually looking out on the city because i i just i got like snapped out of it by by this person that just Oops. that Say felt it. like Oops. They, Oops. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that they Sorry. That felt like they needed oh. to flash the entire city of Paris. They were just like, you know, that's that's what they wanted to do, and it it was so shocking and unexpected that that it shook me out of my own inner world of fear, and 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 allowed me to enjoy the the experience. I yeah, I could see your face. I know it. Just just go ahead. Right. Go ahead. It's oh, still there. Actually, actually, actually. Yeah, yeah let's, <laughs> we'll go there. I'll, I'll leave it for final thoughts. <laughs> I've been sitting here trying to think of like some momentous experience to share with you all that changed my life forever. And I just don't know if I have one. Like I have lots of experiences and they were all beautiful and magical and amazing. And I just don't know if they really, if I've really reflected on how much they really affected me or not. But I can remember one moment when I really decided that I loved cosplay and I was like, give me the thing I was going to do from now on forever and ever. Um, and it was my first time I went to NakaCon. Um, that wasn't my first convention. It, uh... It's actually like six years after I started cosplaying. Before that, before this moment, I was the young, like, 16-year-old cosplayer who didn't know how to make anything, um, was going to, like, their very their only home convention once a year. That's all I was doing. And my grandma would make my cosplays because I had no idea how to do anything. Okay, so fast forward, NakaCon, my very first experience there. We went because I wanted to get an autograph from Nobu Matsu. That's who I was there for. Um... <laughs> And so I decided, what the hell, we're in the contest too. That's what I'm here for too. And I remember I was in my Sorceress Edia from Final Fantasy VIII, my favorite Final Fantasy, the best one. We can argue about it later if you want. Um, and I remember the moment I walked out on stage, which was hard because she has this giant golden like half window back piece that sits there. So I can't walk forward through a door. I can't walk sideways through a door. I have to squat down and hunch sideways through doorways. And... Uh, I walked out on stage and they had a table that had the judges sitting there. And I remember I like pointed all evilly because I'm a villain and with my long black pointy fingers that I had um, with gloves. And I remember like the last judge at the end, you could see her face and she was just like, wow. Like I, I was something amazing to look at. And ever since then, I'm still chasing that feeling. That's, that's what I'm going for every time. Um, oh. <laughs> and... She ended up giving me her Judge's Choice Award. I think I wowed her that much. And it was just my first award. It was the most amazing feeling ever. So Awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> mine's mine's going to be oddly different than everyone else's. So I used to take care of uh, individuals with developmental disabilities. And uh, one of them, he was an older gentleman, uh, was non-commutative verbally, but knew some sign. And so we went to Six Flags St. Louis. And he... I don't know if inside he had a thrill seeker gene that he just needed to just fulfill. But I told him, I was like, hey, we can go to one ride and I'll pay for it. And I was like, which one do you want to go to? And so we're walking through the park and he's looking around and then he sees one. and He's like and just starts just pointing ferociously like that's the one that's the one. And it was a giant swing where you both get hooked in and it's not that I'm not a fan of heights, but when it's just a big canvas hammock that you're laying in and you're like, Hey, I got to pull a cord and then hope this sucker just goes down smoothly like a pendulum back and forth, back and forth. So we get up there. We finally get him strapped in me strapped in. We get on the little ramp that picks you up. Uh, and then it starts just do, 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 pulling you all the way back. And I can see that he's just like, oh, I made a bad choice. I made a, mm, 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 
and so he's like got a hold of my hand just gripping like don't let go and so it's like one of those instances where i was like i'm not not terrified but i don't want to be terrified and then him just be like oh god we're both gonna die now because we're both terrified so i just held on i was like okay hold on you ready we're getting ready to go and they count you down three two one and then i go all right here we go and and as soon as i pull it he just and sorry they tell you they're like oh yeah you can put your arms out but if you want to hold on to this you get more stability and so he was just like super manning it he was like oh my god i'm flying i finally did it and that was like one of those moments where i was just like wow I don't know how many really cool, happy moments he's had in his life, but I guarantee you that's one of them. Awesome. That's beautiful. Yeah. Ash, any final thoughts? Any Anything you want the people to know about you, uh, about things you do? Anything. The floor is yours. Well, you say that. I'm just going to talk for hours and hours. You shouldn't have done that one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I think when I was pre-thinking over what this podcast would sound like for me. Um, one of the things that I thought about was um, looking at certain situations and trying to navigate your way, especially through arguments. You know, you get you get heated, you get angry, and your anger kind of takes over. I, believe it or not, I'm a very tiny but angry person. And uh, I've learned that through my people watching and especially asking the question of why somebody does something, like what's their motive, what's their reason, what's their background, what's their beliefs with this, um, it's really kind of quelled my anger in the moment um sure i'll scream and yell at somebody but pretty quickly i've kind of trained myself to stop and think i'm like okay what's their what's their reason for this and instead of i'm not usually angry anymore at that person for what they did i'm usually end up finding myself angry at like what brought them to do that and what's what's their reasons behind it some people get really mad at me now because when they try to argue with me i've already thought about these kind of things and so I'll come to the table and be like, look, I know you're about to say this because you believe this, and now I have this to come to rebuttal that already. And they're like, Ash, it's no fun arguing with you anymore if you've already won the <laughs> argument in your head. But <laughs> um, that's definitely, like, I guess my final thought would be, like, if you have some kind of, like, anger problems, that really stopping and thinking about why somebody does this, what brought them to that moment, why did that come out of their mouth, you know, what what made them do that action, it makes me not hold on to that anger anymore like i have some people that definitely deserve some anger from me like i've been burned before in my life but i can let it go because i understand what brought them to that point i don't agree with that they shouldn't do that but that is not something i'm going to hold on to anymore because it doesn't affect me anymore some some genuine wisdom coming from from ash there Uh, you should you should hold on to that and really really take that in um, so if I didn't have a teacher moment, this wouldn't be a, a real interview with me. So. <laughs> do you have somewhere that people can follow you online? Uh, do you, do you want people to follow you online? If so, where can they find you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, all of my cosplay stuff is on Facebook and Instagram. I try not to social media too much, so I stick to the two. Um, both of them are Badash Cos or Badash Cosplay. Um, and it's mostly cosplay, but you also see pictures of my dogs a lot. So. <laughs> You like dog pictures, they're on there as well. Um, and I, I occasionally talk like on my stories about teacher life and home life and whatever else happens across life. So um, yeah, Instagram and Facebook, Badash Cause. Hey, it's been great talking to you, Ash. This has been interesting. <laughs> Just fun it's conversation. It's definitely, definitely been interesting for me too. I, I thank you guys because it's always fun to talk to new people and not everybody wants to sit down and talk about weird stuff like people watching. It's it's too personal, you know? And it's, it's exactly. It's it's amusing. It's amusing for your mind. Oh, I uh, see what you did there. He said the thing. So that wraps up our interview with Ash. Thank you so much, Ash, for joining us. But we will be right back after this break to give our final thoughts. So stick around for more podcasts. We'll be right back. And welcome back. So I have some more thoughts on this whole people watching thing you know i think basically everybody does this and we have a lot of differences between what people watching is like in real life versus what happens on the internet Um, we have lots of different reasons why we do it from 
uh, creating relationships to entertainment and just sort of getting some sort of uh, entertainment pleasure out of out of watching things happen to other people, even so far as to be something like a CIA sleeper agent, building these narratives and stories around these people that you don't know, just so that you have some sort of mind's eye theater going. So, yeah, I mean, sure, why not? Um, I really think, though, as our viewers and listeners uh, take time to kind of just think about the episode and it was fun and stuff, we really need to look at how we're doing this, if we're all, like you say, doing it, or if we just find ourselves doing it. How can we learn from this? Can we really gain more from stepping back outside of ourselves and looking into what other people are doing, how they're living, and what they have to offer? And is it really that different for us to analyze people and analyze ourselves? Is it different for us to see it on screen or is it different for us in person? And what do those impacts and effects have on us as individuals? I really think we can learn a lot from this, just looking at ourselves and continuing to try to learn and grow. I have to say that for me, it's literally like everyone's trying to find a piece of who they are through other people. They're trying to find a sense of community, a sense of belonging, a sense for maybe right in the world. Maybe they're trying to find things that bring them joy, find things that bring others joy. Find things that bring sadness, pain. By watching other people, we're kind of studying ourselves. Like, not so introspectively, but, you know, it literally is just us trying to see the world. Hey, guys. Thanks for joining me, Rodney, Ben, and Larry on another episode of Amusing Minds. If you guys want to hear more from us or watch us, you can find us on Anchor.fm, Facebook, and YouTube. If you would like to leave us a message and be part of the show, Anchor is the best place to leave a message. If you want to just communicate with us and talk, Facebook and YouTube are both great places for that. I hope you enjoyed the show and be sure to tune in next time where we talk about fish and funny facts or funny voices and fish facts. It's all going to be a great time. Hope to see you guys there.